priority is make sure the guy doesn't get to the gun. Yeah. I'm not trying to go for a submission. How many black belts do we know that when the rear naked choke on a robber and the robber just shot him behind the head? Rube, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Now, I've known this man for, what, 14 years almost. I, I would say somewhere around there, right? Yeah, when you were just, yeah, you were just a striker doing MMA. Yeah. Under yep. Dean Thomas. Yep, yep, yep. I do want to get into the background a little bit because for those that are watching and listening, okay. you know, don't know who you are, go back and, and explain to them exactly like how you got to where you're at now. So like the high on to jujitsu, like the whole yeah thing. yeah yeah. So martial arts and now you know law enforcement things like that. Okay yeah, um, my name is Ruben Alvarez. Uh, I started jujitsu when I was probably 15 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm 31 now, so I've been in it for a while. Yep. So 16 years of jujitsu. Um, yeah, I came from a, a good family. Both parents were cops, whole family's cops. Mm -hmm. um, dad was a martial artist, traditional style, like karate and stuff like that. Oh, nice. Um, and yeah, I started with traditional martial arts. I started with Aikido. Um, and then my godfather was my Aikido instructor. He was actually under Steven Seagal. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so my, my brown belt in Aikido has Steven Seagal's signature in kanji. That's cool. Yeah, under okay. tension Aikido. Nice. Um, so yeah, I did that. And then one day we're sitting down, we're watching a Gracie's in action video mm -hmm. and like, I'm seeing hoist and like these like Hoyler and all them just beating up all these like, you know, Kung Fu karate, Aikido dudes. And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, can these guys whip your ass? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> why am I doing this shit? Uh, I need to do that. So at least he was honest. Yeah. And, uh, he, and he, he was, he was, uh, he was open-minded. Like he brought in Mike Cardozo, who was my first jujitsu coach. Nice. Yeah. Um, Tuesdays and Thursdays to teach. And then uh, when Mike left, he brought in George Masvidal when George was uh, at Freestyle Fighting Academy. Wow. So I go back when George, before even George did the backyard brawls. Really? Yeah. So I was training with George like when, well, yeah. He was probably like 15 then or 16. He right? was, uh, he was like 18 or 19 then. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 He was like 18, 19. He was young. It was before he even had the game bred neck tattoo. Damn. Yeah. You know, um, and then... Yeah, after that, I went to the Valente brothers for a little bit, trained with Carlos Velaris. Mm -hmm. uh, did the, you know, the self-defense jiu-jitsu for Emilio Gracie. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Carlos ended up moving. So I moved my jiu-jitsu back with Mike Cardozo because he opened his own gym finally, Extreme okay. MMA. Okay. Went with him all the way to Purple Belt. And then from Purple to Black, I went under Cyborg and Wagner Rocha. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, I ended up leaving the team and going under Tom DeBlast now. So I've gotten my two degrees in my jujitsu black belt under Tom DeBlast. Mm -hmm. So I'm under him now. Been with him for probably like six years now, six or seven years. What's the difference, would you say, the major difference between Tom's way of coaching and like Wagner's way of coaching? Um, the, they kind of have like the same coaching, but I think uh, with Tom, Tom's more uh, like one-on-one, -on -one, like he's more personal, like mm -hmm. him and I share like the same kind of stories and yeah, stuff. And yeah. he's very supportive and, and, gotcha. and he actually, it's like a, a two way street between us. Like, mm -hmm. and there's a loyalty there. I, I, I go months without talking to Tom, but if Tom sends me a message like, Hey, I need you on a flight to, mm -hmm. to my gym ASAP, yeah. hands down, I'm stopping what I'm doing and going up to, mm -hmm. you know, Tom's river, ocean County Jiu Jitsu and helping him out with whatever he needs. That's cool. So yeah. Tom and I, you know, uh, have a great relationship. Wagner's a great instructor. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just it wasn't for my style. Yeah, yeah. But great jujitsu guy. When you were a purple belt, because I know that's like the transition phase. Like blue belt, you're kind of finding your way. You're still in it. Um, very consistent. Usually, the blue belts are the ones that are most aggressive. Yeah. Usually, right. Also, the ones that go missing the most too. Yeah. Like stop jujitsu as soon as that happens, right? Yeah. Why is that though? Why so with blue belt? Let's go through the belt rankings here, because you get your white your white belt. You're you're kind of brand new. You're just finding out, you know, how to do things, and then you get the blue belt. And I would say eighty to ninety percent. I'm just throwing out arbitrary numbers, but somewhere around there, they all quit. Right? It's like okay, we've reached the pinnacle of of success in this particular sport. Now we're done. Why is that? Why do people just quit after that? Um. You, there's like no rhyme to reason usually it's like everybody has different things that happen like life you know some get a girlfriend yeah. the girlfriend's like i don't want you training as much mm. you know others they get a new job and then yeah. they stop going you know it's like 
that's the first step. Like blue belt is the first step. You still don't know much at mm -hmm. blue belt. You know, it's like when you get to purple and brown, you're like, all right, now I'm in it for the long run. Yeah. You know, but you have purple belts that quit too. Yeah. And you have uh, brown belts that quit. You know, and then you get the dudes that get black belts, and then once they get the black belt, they stop training. training yeah. You know, or maintaining. You know, mm -hmm. like for me, I maintain. I don't train every day. Yeah. Well, you, you got know. other things. Yeah, hey, I got my job now. <laughs> yeah. You know, but like, you know, I was, I was, you know. Thanks to God, I was able to get my black belt and, you know, do what I needed to do as a professional jiu-jitsu grappler or whatever, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, before it was the cool thing, you know, and, you know, meet guys like you, meet mm -hmm. all the people that I met, you know, and um, do that before I got into law enforcement. But mm -hmm. for blue belt, I think the reason that so many blue belts quit is because there's so many blue belts. It's just, yeah. you know, if you look at the ratio, it's probably the same from blue and purple. It's just Always. there's mm -hmm. less purples and blues, you know, like. Yeah. Blue is the probably the fastest belt you could get, you mm -hmm. know. But blue to purple, you know, that takes a while. And then purple to brown takes a while. Like for me, it was purple to brown. I was at my longest, mm. you know. And then you got black, yeah. And then black is just years of you know teaching and mm. training as much as you can. And then you get your stripes from your instructor. Yeah. Now it's just a time thing. As a blue belt, what should you be focused on? Focus on what your coach tells you. Mm. You know, um, your coach is going to know your game like what you should work on and what you shouldn't work on. Mm -hmm. B, I harp on fundamentals, yeah. you know, like fundamentals, are, you go always divert back to fundamentals. Mm -hmm. You know, the best guys, they don't do anything flashy. They just stick to the fundamentals. Same thing as shooting, yeah. fundamentals. Yeah. You know, the cool stuff comes eventually, but if you don't have a good base, mm -hmm. then, you know, it's going to be, it's not going to be good for you. Yeah. But yeah, fundamentals and do what your coach tells you. Usually, if your coach is like a really good coach, they're gonna they're gonna steer you in the right direction. They should know your body type, mm -hmm. what you need to do. Same thing as like what you do for you know training, training yeah. athletes. Mm -hmm. Like each athlete has a different set goal, and you yep. judge them off their body type, what they could do, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you train specifically for them. Same mm -hmm. should be for the blue belt. You think blue belt should be finding their game? Uh, primarily at that stage or you know transitioning into purple belt when they actually can solidify their game i think they are finding their game like i found leg locks when i was a blue belt and yeah. i just ran with it ever gotcha. since and i've always been fascinated with just doing leg locks you know mm -hmm. usually uh brown and black is when i started getting really good guillotines good kimuras mm -hmm. you know um purple belt i was just a leg locker mm -hmm. at purple i didn't really finish a lot of dudes with guillotines or kimuras mm -hmm. and then brown and black fine-tuning those skills of because everybody knew I was gonna do leg locks <laughs> so you know eventually I had to switch it up yeah so yeah um, as for blue that you, you're learning your game you're finding it out mm -hmm. and your coach should be the one that's like hey maybe you should try this mm -hmm. you know? with somebody starting out jujitsu and there's a lot nowadays like there's jujitsu gyms around every corner um, what you do you think should be the main focus when you're just starting out. White belt, just coming into a to a uh, to a to a school. What should be their main focus? This episode is brought to you by Eight Sleep. Now, Eight Sleep is a company that has been gracious enough to lend me and give me a bed to actually sleep on that is gonna increase my quality of sleep overall. Me and my wife have loved this bed and we must say that it has honestly been a game changer, not only for our ability to sleep better, but also our ability to perform when we wake up. Their mission is fueling human potential through optimal sleep using innovative technology and personal biometrics. They're not just a bed or a bed company, it's a health and wellness company focused on sleep itself. Now that pod that I was talking about, they've been graciously giving me, is redefining the entire experience of sleep. Leveraging data and technology to improve overall health and wellness in a way that no other company is currently doing. Now, in an essence, they are a health and wellness company that is focused on sleep. Now, the app is where all the magic happens. That's where you're gonna track your data. That's where you're gonna track your sleep quality. And that's going to enhance your abilities to program yourself and program your athletes if you wanna do so, if you are a coach. You can view your sleep and health metrics. You can adjust your temperature. You get insights. It personalizes your sleep experience. The pod is a sensor layer that tracks and improves your sleep by dynamically heating or cooling temperatures of your base of the bed. And it'll get better every night because you'll constantly be using it and it'll start to track and understand your body and you can integrate it into whatever health tracker you're using at the moment now if you want to get your hands on one just go to eight sleep.com that's eight spelled out sleep.com and let them know that i sent you now let's get back to the podcast um you gotta think like what's the white belts 
end goal because mm. remember it's an end user sport so like it's yeah. what the end user wants out of it you know are you just coming to jiu-jitsu to get in shape you know feel better about yourself or are you mm. coming in, mostly everybody comes from like the self-defense act, mm. aspect of it but for jiu-jitsu for me it's like um if you're a white belt you know get the basics down same thing fundamentals everything's about the fundamentals mm -hmm. the coach should be the dictator that time yeah. you know like uh john donner i think said it mm -hmm. where it was uh you know white to blue I'm the dictator. You're doing all the fundamentals, yeah. getting good. You at least have to know how to shrimp, break fall, you know, no basic sweeps, mm -hmm. you know, no, you know, guard pulls, no takedowns, you know, mm -hmm. um, like know everything that's basic and fundamental and, and then know how to survive, know the defenses. Yeah. White belt's the stage of survive. survive yeah. You know, it's <laughs> like you think about like Robert Downey Jr. and mm -hmm. Tropic Thunder survive, you know, <laughs> like that's what a white belt's supposed to do. They should be like, learning how to defend because you know your first few months as a white boy you're just getting your ass kicked yeah you know no matter who you go with no matter who you go with you go with the guy that's a, a yeah. two-stripe white ball and then all of a sudden like he just taps you out and you're like dude yeah what's going but on? you're getting your ass beat but you're enjoying the process mm -hmm. you know usually the ones that quit are the ones that are just like used to always dishing out ass weapons and not taking them yeah you know yeah, they're like oh yeah, you get so. that so all right let's finish with the uh, backstory here so now you're a black belt what made you transition into going into law enforcement? Uh, what made me go into law enforcement? Well, it was a family trait. It was also my plan B. Mm -hmm. My goal was never to go into law enforcement. Mm -hmm. I ended up, uh, you know, having a bad business deal uh, that like kind of took took a little piece of me away from jujitsu where I was like, ah, you know, like yeah. I don't want to go into explanation because it's in the past, but sure. you know, um, you know, it kind of like made me a little bit bitter, you know, mm -hmm. but then there was, there was a guy, Elon, um, he was the owner of Black House Miami Beach. Mm -hmm. Great dude, he gave me an opportunity. He had me run Black House Miami Beach. Nice. And there, that's when I catapulted, because that was my own name now. I focused on me, I had my own guys. Mm -hmm. You know, the program was mine, you know. I got to do, he gave me freedom to do whatever I wanted, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I was having, you know, like, ADCC champ come in, you yeah. know, world champions. Mikey Musumichi came and visited me a couple of times, mm -hmm. you know, um, had a bunch of dudes, you know, and uh, I had a good little group of guys, yeah. you know, that were all hungry. And it, it was like, a, as an instructor, it's like I wanted them to be better than me. I wanted my own homegrown guys to beat me up. For sure, and yeah. it was getting to that point, you know, I had my black belt currently, uh, Tony Mello, he would come in, mm -hmm. you know, he would drive all the way from Pines. Mm -hmm. and train with me on Sundays and you know now he's a killer the dude beats my ass now he's my mm -hmm. black belt you know I would have uh just a bunch of good dudes uh one of my purple belts Scott Barona he would come he that kid uh, he went from white um to blue with me and then got his purple from Stan Beck and then came back to me but like when Stan promoted him I was there like I, I, I referred him stay to loyal stay yeah because I wasn't um I wasn't teaching when he got his purple belt, mm -hmm. you know, but the kids just were really good, yeah. you know, and, uh, like he was, he was, he was really good. And then, um, like he would train with me all the time, mm -hmm. you know, he, he wouldn't respect me when we rolled, like he would come after me, yeah. you know, and then, uh, it is actually, it is respectful. Yeah. You like know. I like when, <laughs> I don't like when, yeah, like I'm one of those like black belts where it's like, if the white belt comes and asks me to roll, I'll roll with them. I don't, yeah. Yeah. I like, I'm a black belt. Don't ask me to roll. For sure. Yeah. You know, and I get like the whole traditional stuff, yeah. but for me, it's like that shows me that you want to push yourself. Yeah. That shows me you want to be better. Want to compete. Wanna now, compete. if they come at me disrespectful, like, "Hey, bro, I'm gonna beat your ass in this roll." Okay, yeah, we're rolling, but no. I ain't. So here's the thing: where's the fine line between like having fun, being competitive, and talking shit and being disrespectful? D uh, it depends on the mood. Yeah. Like, like how are how's the context and intent behind it? Uh huh. You know, it's like. Mm -hmm. Like if I tell you, hey, with well, a slight smile, hey, man, I'm gonna beat, beat your ass, dude. Like joking yeah. around, you're like, all right, dude, you're just joking around. But I'm like, hey, Phil, you know, what? let's roll. I'm gonna beat that ass. You're yeah, like, yeah. huh? Yeah. yeah who do you think you're talking to? Yeah, now it's fighting. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, ask him, you want white or wheat, bro? Which one <laughs> you want, dude? We're gonna do some combat jujitsu. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it depends on like the context and intent of how they're portraying that message. Sure. Um. But yeah, man, I, I had a whole group of killers, and then one of them actually trains here with you. I ran into him one day, Alex Rogers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he was one of the up and coming blue belts on my mm -hmm. on my squad. Mm -hmm. You know, and that kid that kid had a lot of talent. Now he's fighting MMA. Yep. You know, yeah. um, so yeah, you know, I did that, and then 
from there, I was like, you know, jujitsu is great and all, but Elon uh, was moving to California to run the main black house and stuff. And I, I didn't want to run the business without him because, you know, he was such a great dude. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? I, and my, my love for jujitsu was kind of fading because it was becoming a job rather than what I originally did. It was like for, yeah. you know, a hobby and a, a passion. You know, passion. Mm -hmm. It became a job. Yeah. Every day I was waking up, you know, and doing jujitsu. I was like, oh, I got to do something. Yeah. So. I ended up going into law enforcement, following the family business, you know, mm -hmm. went into law enforcement, did that, and, you know, still doing it, and I love it. Yeah, what's the, so I did want to ask you this, the comparison of, you know, working in, now you're in SWAT, working in that environment with the comparison of competitive jiu-jitsu, what's the mindset like there? So being on SWAT is like being on a competition team. Mm -hmm. Everybody there is like uh, whatever mythical creature you want to call it or, you know, alpha or mm -hmm. I don't know, sheepdog, whatever shit that everybody calls it now. Mm -hmm. But it's all like A-type dudes that just like are competitive and they have a competitive nature. Like me, I don't really get competitive anymore because it's out of my system. I did it for years. You know, I just want to, I'm, I'm always at competition with myself. Let me, let me, let me go ahead and, and say this. When he was a competitor, he was the competitor. Like, you were very competitive. Yeah, yeah. And, and aggressive, too. Like, he wasn't, when you talk about who's a competitor, when I talk about those four archetypes, he was definitely a competitor. Yeah, like, when I was competing, it was, I eat, sleep, breathe it. Like, in high school, I was cutting weight, you know, mm -hmm. walking around the school with my sweats on. Nobody knew what jiu-jitsu was then. Yeah. Back then, when we started, yeah. MMA wasn't really MMA, it was NHB. Yeah, you know, we're fighting in strip clubs and stuff. Yeah, and there's still bare knuckle fights going on. Mm -hmm. You know, like the RFCs and uh, yeah. what was that other one? There was another one that was oh. that was great in Tampa. That I remember Roger fought in a few times. Roger Crawl and some of those guys. Yep. Um, I think it was like NFC or something like that. Or NFC, no. and then there was WFC. Oh yeah. WFC, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. WFC. Okay. Okay, okay. Battle in the Bay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That they wfc is the one that i fought on in tampa yeah wfc yeah. and then you had rfc rfc i fought on like three like two or three cars, yeah I think. yeah and you had the fight times back when howard yeah. davis was still alive you know? yeah yeah that 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 ended up getting bigger um almost after i was done fighting actually like dean actually fought on that car dean got into a uh a car accident on the way over to fight uh, i think it was uh baboon like it was it was palomino Oh yeah? Yeah, I think that was I forgot. he was fighting. Somebody. It was either him or it was uh I wanna so it was say, Dean or was it uh it was Dean, yeah. It was I remember Dean. we were all there. And he got in a car accident on the way to the actual fight. It's crazy. I remember Dean showing up at uh some of the super fights I had when I went against Eric Luke at yeah. The, oh yeah, man, Eric Luke. At, uh, at the Space Coast thing where they had those like yeah. backyard brawls or whatever. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. That's or, funny, man. Yeah, at, w went to Treasure Coast Harley to weigh in. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And I remember the doctor, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Eric so Luke funny. told me something funny, and I was like, "Oh damn!" Like the doctor went to like, like check us like here, and like uh, I don't know what it was, but it was like a hernia check or whatever. Yeah. And I saw Eric Luke put his hand on top of the dude's head. And he's like, "If we can make it awkward for me, I'm gonna do it to you." And then I did it right after Luke did it. Yeah. You know, because I was like, "Yo, this is weird." I will put my hand on it. Yeah, and the doctor's man. like, "What's wrong with you guys?" That's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. And Eric Luke told me that, and, it, and we we became boys after that. You know, and I grappled Chain too from from. Uh, really. Yeah, and then there's a couple other guys that grappled. You yeah. know, back in the day. Yeah, you did a lot. So I do want to. Well, let's let's go back because they're gonna find us anyways. But I do want to talk about it. Like, the major injury that you that you had in the competition that I went to, yeah, right? When you, well, explain a little bit what happened there. So I went against Hector Lombard, yep. uh, first round. We all know yeah. Hector. Yeah, Hector. Go check out Hector Lombard's uh, podcast. You know, Hector uh, was a big dude, man. Yeah. And the thing was, is like, I was like, back then I was this like, is This is a Hector Lombard that was like 22-0, and 0, or, or had 22 the, fight win streaks, Bellator champ. Yeah. yeah, middleweight Bellator yeah. champion. Mm -hmm. In his prime. Uh, yeah, in his fucking prime. cock diesel, man. Yeah, you know, uh, just young and hungry. Mm -hmm. And then there was me, 140-pound Ruben grappler. I, I wasn't scared of shit, dude. <laughs> you know, I was like, yeah. you know, I was coming off of good wins at, at, at that age, you know, mm -hmm. Pro Bowl, 19 years old, you yeah. know, and uh, went against Hector. And, dude, he locked a, a good ankle lock on me, and I I thought I had a toehold on him. And, yeah. dude, he was just so strong. 
snap my tib and fib right in half. Oh my god. Um, it didn't protrude out of the skin or anything. It was just yeah. a clean break. Um, and it shows how much output that dude has, bro. He's just yeah. so strong. Yeah. But um, you know, I learned a lot from that. You know, I learned uh, I learned like you know adversity. You know, sure. and you also learn who's real, like who came and visited my mm -hmm. buddy Chris Casmar and uh, he would always visit me, um, you know, Enrico Coco would visit me, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of a lot of dudes yeah. would come visit me. Did this so did did this deter you from wanting to train at all or, or compete anymore? Or did you no, just like, oh, it just... pissed me off, dude. Gotcha. Uh, right now, my black belt, Tony, he he broke his ankle. He has pins and screws and. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people were asking him, hey, are you going to quit? And he's like, no. Yeah. You know, when you love it so much, like, I love jiu-jitsu. All the best things in life for me have come from jiu-jitsu. This conversation we're having is yeah. we met through jiu-jitsu. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it opens a lot of things to me. It opened my career in law enforcement. For you know, sure. it got, you know, SWAT and all that mm -hmm. stuff. So it's, you know, jiu-jitsu is great, man. Yeah. You know, but the injury, yeah, like, I didn't, I didn't, I, I knew I was going to be back. You know, they told me, oh, you might not mm. be the same again. I was like, yeah, you know what? Fuck you. <laughs> you know, who are you to tell me this? Yeah. The only person that can tell you that is yourself. You know? Yeah. No, definitely. You did battle back and you kept kept it moving forward. There was an incident at a gym. Mm -hmm. And it's been well documented. Yeah. Funniest thing I could say, man, that, that I've seen him be a part of. <laughs> and can you explain why we don't like fake black belts? <laughs> Because if you look at it, like, how long have you been doing it? And you're you're still purple, right? Four times be getting my brown belt in a month. You be getting your brown belt in a month. So you've been doing jiu-jitsu. 14 we've known, years. Yeah, we've known each other at least, like, 14 years. Because I remember when I met you, you were a white belt. You were just a striker. Yeah, I wasn't even really training jiu-jitsu. Yeah, like yeah. I was just having You looked at the gi like. Yeah, true. And then what's funny is, like, <laughs> even sidetracking, and what's funny is, like, I see my cousin doing powerlifting with you and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, yeah. uh you guys know each other? <laughs> like, this is crazy, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and then I used to work with Mike Delapava at 24-Hour yep. Fitness yep. before he was the battle axe. Yep, yep. Before he was the so crazy. the Viking man that he is. Mm -hmm. He used to be Strong like one of those, like, did Muay he really? Thai. He did Muay Thai, and he was like, ah. Oh. And yeah. now he's like, yeah. Definitely like, not. This is complete I like opposite. this new Mike. Yeah, you know? <laughs> he's a good but, uh, Yeah, he's a, he's a great dude. Um, but anyways, like, yeah. So the, the jiu-jitsu thing was... Um, why we don't like fake black belts is because, dude, it, it's one of those things that you earn. It's not one of those like martial arts where you sign a mm -hmm. contract and you're guaranteed a black belt. It's like yeah. everybody that, it's a journey. Like everybody talks about the journey. Yeah. You know, some people cry when they like get their black belt. Some people, like I cried when I got my black belt. I didn't know sure. I was getting it. Yeah. Um, and it's like, you know, you work so hard. You think about like the leg, the injuries, yeah. the relationships that fail through jujitsu. Like yeah. I had a lot of relationships fail because girls would be like, "Hey, either me or this competition." I'm like, mm -hmm. "Sorry, yeah. it's the competition." You know, because it was always that pursuit of betterment. You know that that mm -hmm. I talk about. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, like you have somebody come in, come into your gym, and you have you pay you still pay homage where like the lower belts bow to the black belt. Mm -hmm. They have to go shake their hand when they get on the mat, and you know mm -hmm. ask them to roll and things like that. You know, yeah. And that person just shows up wearing a black belt. Yeah, no, it doesn't go well. You mm -hmm. know, and back then I was like super young and hungry. Yeah. And I was, I was kind of like pissed off at the world a little bit because like yeah. things that happened to me, you know, and and jujitsu for me was like you know like this is the only thing I got. Yeah. You, know, you wanna. Well, come in here and reap the benefits, train at my gym for free and do this. No. But then again, like, you know, if I if I look at myself now, if I would have done it, I would have done it more privately. You know, like one of the students was recording it mm -hmm. and stuff. And I went over like a whole debrief on what happened there, you know, and a lot of people love it. You know, and a lot of people were like, oh, no, you should have been like Mr. Miyagi. Well, so. Well, explain to the, because people that don't know what actually happened, what what transpired. There. So a fake black belt came in my gym. Um, you know, he said he was a black belt under a certain uh, famous black belt from Brazil, mm -hmm. you know, Macaco. And um, he was training at my gym for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, I was looking at things that, I, like, can't fake, you know. And yeah. then he would give, like, a story like his back was messed up or whatever. Yeah. And uh, I ended up cross-referencing it, asking a couple, of, like, dudes I know that were under that same instructor. And he's like, no, they never heard of this guy. Mm -hmm. So, like, I would give him a chance. I'd be like, hey, man, are you sure you're a black belt, dude? Just tell me. Mm -hmm. No. Like, I am a black belt, you know. Mm. You sure, bro? Who'd you get it under? Oh, uh, yeah, this guy. And I'd ask him. And it's like, when when you keep asking, and then they're trying to make you a fool about something that you know a lot about. Yeah, yeah. 
you're, you're gonna snap you know that's sure. like you know somebody walking into you into the gym now and telling you like oh this is how you need a deadlift mm -hmm. or telling you that you need to work more on me because you know i'm sweating too much and i look like my heart's about to give out you know <laughs> so like you got you got yeah. people like that 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 think they're experts when they didn't take the time to put in their craft like you take the time like when you talk you're not just yeah spitting out bullshit yeah. you're, you're spitting out facts yeah. same thing so when he did that you know i ended up just snapping and then that's where you see the video but i welcomed him back i told him come back mm -hmm. you know get a white belt come up and we'll eventually make you a black belt but you have to earn it it's not given yeah problem is with society now is we like to give things away we like to give participation trophies yeah. and that's why you have what's going on now in society absolutely entitlement mm -hmm. you know like 14 years and you're just getting your brown belt larry mm -hmm. acres I know. 14, 15 years of jiu-jitsu just got his brown belt. That's so crazy. You know? Yeah. I mean, we're in the same boat. Like, listen, at the end of the day, it's about the, the process. It's about the journey. You mm -hmm. should be f passionate about learning. It should be about, you know, obviously progressing, but also, you know, taking advantage of the opportunities every day and, and, and learning around that, feeling good about actually getting better as opposed to, oh, the end result. Yeah. That's the biggest issue is people want that instant gratification and they can't have it. Everybody wants to chase the end, but you don't know when yeah. the end's coming. Mm -hmm. So like, just enjoy the process. Yeah. Can't look too far forward, can't yeah. look too far back. And it's actually better when you do that and you get the, like, you get the end goal accomplished when you're not expecting it. Yeah. Because it, it's just a better surprise that way. Like when you got your black belt, you didn't know you were getting your black belt. No, you no, know what I mean? sobbed. Like I was like, yeah. I thought about everything that I went through to get to where I'm at. Yeah. You know, yeah. and you're like, damn. Like everybody sure. sees the end result, they don't see the hard work or no, the sacrifices no. yeah. or or the mental struggles that you go through. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody sees that. They just see the end result. Mm -hmm. How did Ruben become a good competitor? Well, Ruben lost his first like ten tournaments. I would freeze. Yeah. Like I'd be like, go. Uh huh. And what did I do to fix it? I just kept showing up. Yeah. You know, until one day I was like, fuck it. Mm -hmm. Showed up, and then I ended up. Went, I started winning. Mm -hmm. You know, but yeah. then. The best thing was like, you know, my parents always like brought me up with like, when you're winning, remember what it was like to lose. Of course. You know, because there's a lot of guys, especially like in jujitsu or even like, you know, in the tactical community that they don't remember what it was like being a beginner. They don't remember what it was like being the new guy. Yeah. And you have to have that white belt mentality at all times. You have to remember what it was like, what was it like for you? Yeah, man, it was, it was um, like, I've, I've had an athletic background. So for me, it was more about calming myself down you know because i was always like go 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 coming from a football background too as well i knew that i had to slow down my pace and actually learn the skills and the techniques as opposed to using my natural athletic ability and that took a long time like it really did and i lost a lot of fights one because of focus and two because i just didn't take the time to actually learn the technique efficiently like today, this morning, we actually went to the range and I got, I finally got my certified. Yeah. Right? So now conceal, I'm ready to go. Your concealed weapons permit. Finally, so right? Not everybody on your network knows that you have a gun on you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's over. It's crazy. It's over. And when you, and you, you know what, I think that you understanding that makes you a better instructor, makes you a better teacher, a coach. When you were telling me, all right, just slow down, you know, get your sights. And then what happened? I was I was on target every time. You know? So like Tim Larkin says it in uh, When Violence is the Answer, mm -hmm. it's a good book. Tim Larkin talks about, you know, slow training leads to depth training, depth training will lead to mastery. Mm -hmm. I don't really believe in the whole perception of slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Mm -hmm. Slow is always gonna be slow. Mm -hmm. Fast will always be fast. Smooth will always be smooth. Mm -hmm. You know, so I go with the modality in my head of smooth. If I need to pick up the pace, I just gotta get smoother. Mm. You know, you say faster, but then fast, you start being reckless, right? Yep. You know, when we started seeing, and you didn't have a lot of shots, like all your shots were in the body. Like none of them went on to like areas that they shouldn't have been. Mm -hmm. But if we wanted to hone it, what do we do? We got smoother. Mm -hmm. And then even your times got faster, mm -hmm. but you were getting smoother. You weren't like, like freaking out. You were just, yeah. boom, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. bringing the shots. Same thing is like that slow training will lead to depth training. The depth training will always lead to mastery. That's so true with everything, man. You know, even in the weight room, you know, uh, understanding placement and then just not rushing a lift. 
a lot of times guys will take the bar off the rack and then just immediately come down. You have to feel the weight first, you know, you have to get it accustomed. Like you have to be accustomed to actually that tension and then you can produce force. But if you're not ready for that, it's going to crash down on you. Yeah. You know? So it's the same thing I felt when I, when we first did it, when I was drawing out of the holster, right? I was rushing the shot and I was missing the mark. It wasn't bad. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't on point. Yeah. It wasn't on the X. It was yeah. on the holes that were wanted or at least that little ring. It was yeah. like outside of the, the little B8 target. It was yeah. on, you know, the white part. Mm -hmm. And we wanted it all inside of that little black circle. Yeah. So. Now, speaking about that, because you, you do teach instruction, right? Arms mm -hmm. instruction and, and, and shooting. And what's the main thing that you're actually looking at um, when somebody comes in to actually learn how to shoot? First thing is I need to know the mindset that they have. Like, I want to know what, like, what's your end result? Like, mm -hmm. you know, if you're, if you're going to be a, it's a tool. Yeah. And the end user is the one that uses the tool. It's either going to be used for good or bad, right? Yeah. Now, I've been blessed, you know, thank, thanks to God that, uh, you know, the, the students I have or the patrons I have, you know, they're law-abiding citizens. They're very, you know, pro, like, self-defense, pro, mm -hmm. you know, law and order, mm -hmm. you know, they're not degenerates. You know, um, and they have the right mindset of like, hey, I know that just this one lesson is not going to be the end all be all. Mm -hmm. Like you have to do repetition, 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 yep. repetition. Yep. You know, some guys take one shooting lesson. They're like, yeah, I'm ready to go. Mm -hmm. You're like, no, you're not. Not by far. Yeah. You know, it's just like how you talk about like lifting mm -hmm. and stuff like that. You have to go, you know, small weight all the way to big weight, yep. you know, yep. and things like that. So. For the beginner, like the end user, I just want to know what their mindset's at. Like, what do they want to have a gun for? Usually everybody's personal protection, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So you have to learn how to get the right gear, the right gun. And that's my job is to provide to them, mm -hmm. you know, Definitely. like you think the white belt thing. Like, I remember what it was like being a new guy. And I remember like some instructor selling me like on this like holster when it was a shitty holster for like overpriced. Yeah. You know, because yeah. they just want to make a quick buck. Of course. You know, it's like you ask me, you're like, how many sponsors you got? I'm like. <laughs> not, none really like i have cigarette gear for the belts but that's because that dude's like family to me and i watch what goes into his product yeah i don't make money off of him yeah you know i i generally like just want guys that have good products mm -hmm. to shoot like that's why i'll go buy holsters on my own dime and test them out and be like yo don't get this yeah, yeah. but then you have guys on the instagrams that are like get this holster it's the best thing and you're like dude in my ecqc class like that holster got ripped off <laughs> you know like it's been pressure tested. Yeah. You know, it's like you with like, you know, fitness equipment. There's good fitness equipment and then there's bad. Nice. Just like instructors is good and bad. Yeah. For the for the new person, like I want them to make sure that, you know, they get the basics down, the fundamentals, just like a white belt. Mm -hmm. But I also want them to have fun, but I also want to let them know that, hey, you need a lot more reps and you need to get good gear and you need to get a good firearm. Yeah. You know, because mm -hmm. buy once, cry once, right? Yeah. You, know, you don't want to buy something that's cheap mm -hmm. and then it breaks on you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's basically my job as an instructor is make sure that they don't get bamboozled. I mean, it's 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 organic and it's authentic of what you actually use. So it's easy for you to be like, yo, get this. It's the same thing with with all the sponsors that I have. Like, I actually use the products. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and I can't fake that, you know? You and can't. I don't want to be the one giving that out if it's not something that I actually wear or use or whatever the case. So when I asked you that, I knew that it was going to be, like, legit. You know what I mean? And so from there, people are actually more apt to believing in you and what you say and taking your advice because of the fact that you're authentic in your in your in your advice. Yeah, I don't like like the Instagram thing. Like I'm mm. just not I I quit being, you know, PC about things like yeah. if I if I want to be PC, I'll just be quiet mm. and you'll just see the resting bitch face. Mm. You know, I don't want to give an answer that's like, oh, you know, this 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 where it's like you're running around the answer like, you know, you're a fellow Christian, Book of James. Let your yeses be your yeses and your noes be your noes. Absolutely. Don't have it or it's, mm. you know, like wavering, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the thing is like, you know, starting, you know, my faith with God and all that stuff, you know, recently thanks to Sean Bonilla from Ready and Able, it's like, I started reading the Bible and it, and it showed me things that like I was missing, you know, and things that I need to start doing that I still continue to mess up every day, but mm -hmm. that's us being human, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing that I've always had is I want to be treated like how a beginner should be treated, mm -hmm. you know? And, and when I treat my patrons like that, it's like, I want to treat them like the humans that they are and know that you're allowed to make mistakes, but know what gear you should get, what training you should get, not get bamboozled. Mm -hmm. 
you yeah. know, just by a name, you know. True. So what would you say beginner tactical gear is the best gear to get right now? Well, what's, what are you going to do? Are you going to, you know... Let's say it's just for self-defense. Self-defense? Self get a good concealed holster, get a good concealed belt, get a good concealed gun. Mm -hmm. You know, like, if you're a bigger dude, you can run a Glock 17. But if you're a smaller dude, maybe, you know, a Glock 19, maybe a Glock 48, maybe a Glock 43X, maybe a SIG P365XO, or a SIG P365, right? You know, it really depends on, like, you know, the ergonomics of your hand, uh, things like that. Like, look, you shot the 48, yeah. and you did good with it. But when I gave you the SIG XL, you're like, dude, this yeah, leaps and bounds fits my hand better. You know, I'm shooting more accurate. Yeah. You know, it feels better in my hand, and I also conceal it better. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the 48, you barely notice it. The, the P365 XL, you really didn't notice it, mm -hmm. you know, but you felt a difference. Yeah, the definitely. weight, everything like that. Yeah. But, you know, it's really on, like, get a good gun, get a good sight. Like if you want, like if you're running iron sights, you know, get good iron sights. Don't go with stock unless it's like from a reputable brand. Mm -hmm. And then if you're running a red dot, get a good red dot. You know, I, I think everybody should have a red dot. Mm -hmm. It just takes everything out, like the focal shift in the eyes. You don't have to be front sight focused. Like as soon as I told you focus on the target, you're beaming all your rounds hole through hole. Yeah. You know? True. So, you know, it's like, it, it depends on what you're doing. Like if you're going to be a SWAT guy, all right, get a good belt get a good holster, a good retention holster, get a good rifle sling, you know, get good body armor, get good helmet. You know, if you're a regular cop, get a good work belt, get a good holster, you know, have a good gun. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have a, a reputable red dot that you know is gonna last, you know, that you're not gonna, you know, think that you're gonna lose zero off of, mm -hmm. you know, after two shots or if you rack it against the car door, mm -hmm. you know. Um, everything has to be known and pressure tested. Sure. You know, so that's what I do. You know, like usually the, the civilians that train with me, it's all concealed carry stuff. Gotcha. As civilians, what should we be looking out for and what should we be prepared for if something does go down where we have to use our firearm? So I can't give legal advice. Mm -hmm. um, I don't give legal advice. You know, that's that's on the, the end user to get. But uh -huh. the thing that I can tell you is, you know, you're carrying it on you. Yeah. There might have to be a time where you have to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, don't carry it on you thinking that it's never going to happen to you. That's the problem is we have this mindset where it's like we live in Fantasy Island. Like, it won't happen to me mm -hmm. until it does happen to you. Best thing I can tell people is train. Train. Not only just shooting, but weapon-based retention, weapon entanglements. Mm -hmm. Do a shiv works class. Do a, you know, a effective combat class or a SOC P class or something that has... You know, I know ShivWorks really does more of the civilian-based stuff, mm -hmm. and that's who I'm under, you know, Craig Douglas. Mm -hmm. You know, um, his weapon-based entanglement stuff is the gold standard for me. You know, that's that's a guy that... Explain uh, that a little bit, though. So weapon-based entanglement is grappling with guns because, you know, me coming from a jiu-jitsu background, I thought, man, I knew stuff because, you know, I did jiu-jitsu and stuff. Yeah. When a gun's presented, dude, you know, it's open game. Mm -hmm. Whether it's on you or on me, if I'm close enough and I could grab that gun, you know, we're going to fight over it. Yeah. And a lot of dudes are like, oh, yeah, I'll just shoot them. Yeah, well, that doesn't work in real life. Like, mm -hmm. you have to get to your gun first. Mm -hmm. If I close the distance and I get in your shit, yeah. you're not used to being opposed. So how do you know you're going to react opposed? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the biggest, uh, you know, that was a big paradigm shift for me as a, you know, as a, like, I've been opposed in fights, like street fights, being a bouncer, you know, because mm -hmm. most jiu-jitsu guys were, were bouncers on the side. Most of MMA fighters were bouncers on the side. Yeah. So I've been in my fair share of fights. Yeah. You know, I've had bricks pulled out on me. I had a knife pulled out on me. I mm -hmm. Thank God I haven't had a gun pulled out on me, yeah. you know, at, as a bouncer. Mm -hmm. You know, law enforcement, different. I've had everything pulled out on me. Mm -hmm. But for, for bouncer status, I thought I knew stuff from jiu-jitsu and I was blessed to not get into any of those weapon-based entanglements. Mm -hmm. Then I went to a shit works class. I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. Like, and another Dog, guy- He was dodging. Another guy too that was like, that opened his eyes was Cole Miller. Mm -hmm. You know, Cole Miller's in it big yeah. time. Yeah. You know, the dude, the dude's really 
mm. infused in it. Yeah, I see that. You see, know, and that, that, deep into it. And him and I talk all the time. Like yeah. he calls me at least once a week, and we talk about things like that. Like, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Like that? You know, this weapon because there's a difference between jujitsu and mm -hmm. weapon-based entanglements, and you have to know the task versus priority of it. Sure. Priority is make sure the guy doesn't get to the gun. Yeah, You're not trying to go for a submission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many black belts do we know that? Like in Brazil, that when did rear naked choke on a robber and the robber just shot him behind the head? Yeah, yeah. or knife. Yeah, or whatever. knife stabbing somebody. You know, so weapon based entanglements compared to you know sport, you know modalities of training. Yeah, it's totally different. Different. Yeah. You know, you have to know when to switch it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. How many days a week you think that's that's feasible to do? Weapon based training, you do it in jujitsu. Mm -hmm. Like, best thing Craig Douglas ever told me was like, if you want to see like dudes get primitive. Throw a shock knife or a rubber knife in between two technical blue belts, and you watch how it goes from, you know, Barambolos and Spider Guard to like, ah! Yeah. You know, uh, the MMA lab, they just did one too. It was like a viral uh, Instagram video where the really? guy just tosses the fake gun in the middle of the, the cage, and these dudes just go at it. Yeah. It's not that technical. This podcast is brought to you by Vivo Barefoot. Now, check out VivoBarefoot.com. That's the minimalistic shoe that I've been rocking on all my videos. If you've been watching my Instagram and YouTube, those are the shoes that I've been wearing to help my foot gain full foot functionality, strengthen up the intrinsic muscles of the feet to allow myself to perform better and then also reduce the risk of injury. Now, I personally like the Geo Racer Knit and the Primus Light 3. Check them out. Go to VivoBarefoot.com and get the discount code DARU15 to get 15 percent off your final purchase all right now let's get on to the podcast no. it's primitive in nature yeah remember if you're Do whatever getting, you can at that you're point. getting a weapon based entanglement is very very intimate we're close like yeah. you know it's close in proximity high in intensity and it's violent in nature mm -hmm. and it's like who's going to be the most violent but also most tactful too like yeah. know your rules and know when to break them and you know it's going to get ugly well at that point though that's kind of every combat scenario though like when you're first coming into sparring and you've never really 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 sparred it's almost like you you think you're in a fight yeah so then you're in fight or flight automatically and then you revert back to like primitive ways right it may not even look like a boxing sparring match at that point it's just a fight mm-hmm it, I, I would imagine it's the same thing. When same you thing, that. yeah. You know, you have the limbic train of thought and the cortex. You yeah. know, if you train yourself to stay in that cortex when you're under stress, yeah. You know, you're gonna you're gonna be successful. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. but you have to train to get there. Yeah. It's not. There's not people that really just like naturally just like, all right, yeah, this is a new situation. Let me see how mm -hmm. I do. As far as, I mean, you don't have to speak for all of SWAT, but as far as from your perspective. Who makes the best or at least the most efficient SWAT officer? Well, I'll tell you for sure, I am not the most efficient SWAT officer. I have a long way to go. I'm mm -hmm. learning a lot. I'm making a lot of mistakes left and right because I'm still a white belt at this. I'm only two years in the game, mm -hmm. and two and a half years in the game. In SWAT. In SWAT. Police officer. You know, what? like if you tell me jujitsu stuff, I can tell you everything. But mm -hmm. from what I've seen is like I look up, you know, to the, the guys that are my team leaders, yep. you know, like I... They're the ones that are that are mentoring me, and then you know, like my best friend Sean mm -hmm. Monia, mm -hmm. like he has two years more than me on the team. That's two years of a lot of knowledge yeah. and operations. Former MMA guy too. Former as well. MMA jiu-jitsu mm -hmm. guy, purple belt. You know, has his own training company. Mm -hmm. So we feed off of each other. We learn a lot from each other. But yeah. you know, it's like, you know, Larry's one of those one of those mentors for me, dude. Yeah. Like when he's disappointed in me. Shout that, out to Larry. Yeah, way. that shit crushes me. Yeah. But you see how Larry is too. Yep. Larry brings his notepad in, takes notes. Very analytical. Yeah. Very conscientious. Yeah. Love it. And, yeah. you know, like he has a big role on how I do, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, I could get, you know, it hurts when like other team leaders will like tell me when they're disappointed, but when he tells me, dude, yeah, it fucking tough. crushes me, dude. For sure. Because yeah. he goes harder on me than anybody. Yeah. And he cares. You know, yeah. And, and for me, it's like, if you want to be like, like Larry's probably the one that, you know, and then. Mm -hmm. You know, my SWAT commander's a, a dude, he looks like an action figure. <laughs> you know, my SWAT commander looks like an action figure. So like, I'm going to just base it off of, one, they need to be highly organized, self-sufficient, yep, dedicated. And know their craft. 
yeah and be open-minded which you no know, it's pretty cool to see that yep. you know there's guys as senior tenure. very humble humble right like, like the, the commander and the the assistant commander they're both open-minded dudes yep. and they you know they brought in like new stuff yeah you know and and all that and it's like you know they're not sticking to you know the same same training thoughts like the same modality as the training yeah man they, they they adopted the training that i've been doing with you guys which is phenomenal i think that you know changing the narrative in a sense of actual the training process for tactical and law enforcement is going to help you guys not just from a performance standpoint but from a longevity standpoint you know yeah yeah like the training with you is like you know it's leaps and bounds like i used to not get sore from trainings and now every time i do something with you i'm like i told you i was on a track and i'm like yo my legs feel like jello right now man yeah, yeah, yeah. like yeah. you know like i went to go jump a fence and then when i got over the fence mm. like i was about to get over and i'm like oh i'm so sorry the guys were like we only need two i was like oh thank god and i just like <laughs> I lowered myself that. down <laughs> which was funny because some of the guys looked at me they're like what you can't get over the fence i'm like no uh -huh. they said they only need two guys i'm not jumping yeah, over yeah screw that yeah I'm going to walk to wherever they need me. <laughs> Energy efficiency. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, dude, no. Yeah. You know, That's but it, it was funny. <laughs> like looking at their faces like, yeah, you do all this training. Yeah, you can. Like, no. <laughs> Jumped over. They told me, no, we only need two. And then, yeah, we're good. Yeah. Later. yeah. Like Homer Simpson in that, That's so in that funny. episode. But, all right. So before we go, uh, Paradox, explain what that is. So Paradox was a company I started. Uh, thanks to my buddy, Mike. And, uh, and the rich, the original person that got me to start my LLC was Tony mm. uh, Seminot, the mm. Real World Tactical. So, yep. you know, he's the one that like really brought the whole fitness and tactical mm. thing like all together. Yep. Like, Shout out to Tony, Real World Tactical. Know, does all those crazy like yep. jumping over cars and then shooting and then yeah. bring your heart rate up. That's how he got big, man. Doing those crazy shit. Dude, he does a lot of crazy shit, but he has a lot of experience behind it. And him he's too. and he's very knowledgeable. I had a conversation with him. He understands the game. He understands strength training, and obviously he knows the tactical. Dude, I, lo I love that guy to death. Yeah. You know, you know. Sometimes he frustrates me, where like I'm like, he's like my older brother. Yeah, yeah. But you know, Tony, Tony was the one that was like, "Hey, dude." Well, he didn't. He didn't say, "Dude." He's like, "Bro, mm -hmm. you gotta start this LLC. Mm -hmm. Get your bit name out there. You know, you have a lot to offer. Yeah. The combatives, do it, bro." Yeah. And I was like, "Oh yeah." So I got the LLC. Yeah. And then. You know, a couple of buddies on our crew were like hyping me up, like uh, John Bartolo, God rest his soul. Mm -hmm. He had his podcast and stuff and he's like, yo, you need to start Paradox too. Like yeah. Tony told me you got the LLC, why aren't you doing anything with it? And I was like, ah. And then one day I was with my, my buddy Mike, who's also my business partner with Paradox. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at like some Instagram tactical video and I'm like, bro, this guy is like selling a false hope to his students and this is gonna get them killed. Yeah. And he goes, why oh, are you bitching about it? Why don't you just do something about it? And I was like, Damn dog. Mm -hmm. So I had the LLC already. So then I started Paradox. I got rebranded the logo, got the infinite triangle, mm -hmm. you know, did all that. And then I started teaching classes. And Mike is one of those dudes that he was like, dude, I have my own range. Mm -hmm. Come, yeah. come teach at the range. So I already had a spot and everything. Mm -hmm. Cause Mike got sick of the ranges that he was going to cause they were like micromanaging. And he's like, yeah. screw this. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna just save up, get, get what I need to do and the have name. my range. And Mike's business is named Shooter Ready. Shooter Ready. Yeah, so. yeah. Shooter Ready is the range, but gotcha. it's private. You know, it's only for, and he only has it for select instructors. Yep. Like they have to be vetted to yeah, use his range. Eddie goes there a lot, right? Uh, that, Eddie hasn't gone there yet. He there? goes to the the Gladius range. Gladius. Yeah, Gladius right. has their own range. Which gotcha. Those guys are also legit and cool. Mm -hmm. You know, I met all the Gladius dudes. They're all legit. Yeah. You nice. know, and super good dudes. Mm -hmm. So I started Paradox with that. And then I got the blessing from Craig Douglas to teach his system of nice. extreme close quarter concepts or combatives or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and the, it's the real one, combatives. The real combative yeah. stuff. You know, like yeah. there's there's guys out there putting combative stuff that are legit. You know, yeah. you got Jay Wedge, Word, Chad Lyman, mm -hmm. uh, Raul Martinez has road methods. You got David Acosta, great dude. Like that guy is knowledgeable. You got Sean, he does a little bit of combatives. Gotcha. You got like real dudes that, you know, Greg Thompson, Sock P, Chad Pittman, those guys from Sock P are legit. Mm -hmm. You know, they just have a different flavor of how to teach it, but it's legit. It's battle tested and proven. Nice. You know, um, but then you got guys that are just like, you know, I got black bone jiu-jitsu, let me teach you combatives. Mm. It's like, when's the last time you had to handcuff a subject that was on drugs For real. or anything it, like that? It's totally different. So what's cool is that Craig Douglas brings both the experience and the knowledge mm -hmm. behind it. He was, the reason he started shit workers is because he almost got killed 
on a on a drug deal mm. you know so i'm able to teach that now so paradox i just do you know concealed carry classes mm -hmm. the combatives and then basic pistol and rifle mm -hmm. you know i don't do no building tactics or anything like that mm -hmm. i leave that for the guys that are way better than me yeah. i know i know my lane i know where to stick into absolutely that's you know awesome. i'm good at teaching beginners how to shoot better yeah you know it. but i'm also learning too because like i have a shooting coach my shooting coach is scott jedelinski from modern samurai mm -hmm. another jiu-jitsu guy yeah brown belt yeah. you know so he trains under me for jiu-jitsu i train under him for that's cool for shooting yeah, you know cool. when it comes to like writing out lesson plans and things like that um, and learning how to teach better, I go to Will Petty from Centrifuge mm -hmm. Training. Will Petty is one of those dudes that, like, if you look at his stuff, he turned me on the Huberman Lab podcast. Mm -hmm. So now I, I listen to Huberman Lab because yeah. of him. Yeah. You know, so I'm always learning from these dudes. Sure. You know, yeah, and, and, yeah. and what I do is I pay homage to them when I teach my curriculum because I try to use everything that I learned and put it into one thing For sure, yeah. to make it a more effective program out to everybody else. Nice. So if they want to sign up, to get some uh, one on ones and, and some classes, what kind yeah, of they could go uh, check out the Instagram. Uh, the Instagram is probably the best way because mm -hmm. it has a link to the site and everything. Yep. Uh, it's paradox underscore training. Gotcha. So they could go to that and then yeah, that's uh, where they can find me for the the training stuff. Cool. All right. Thanks again, my brother. I appreciate, uh, appreciate you. it, bro. All Thanks right. for having me. Thanks again. We'll see you guys next time.